Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. This is Sarah Huckins, Partnership Manager for Island Press, and I'm excited to welcome you to today's webinar, Fixing Our Broken Water Cycle, a conversation with authors Sandra Purcell and Abby Landis. Uh, today's webinar is put on in collaboration with our partner, River Network. And since its founding in 1988, River Network has been at the forefront of expanding interest in protecting the waters of our country, encouraging diversity in the environmental movement, and helping our community move towards collective action. Um, and we are very lucky to have Nicole Silk, president and CEO of River Network, as our moderator today. And as president of River Network, Nicole leads a dedicated team uh, to grow the power of the network, currently comprising about 3,000 organizations and coalitions who care about clean water and healthy rivers. Uh, prior to joining River Network, Nicole worked at the Nature Conservancy for 19 years as managing director of TNC's global freshwater team and in other positions. She has also worked extensively internationally, both through her career in conservation and as a professional river guide. Nicole's career has centered on how people relate to water and what water needs to remain healthy. So we are excited to have her bring this perspective to our conversation today with authors Sandra Postel and Abby Landis, who have both dedicated their research to examining the health of our water and our ecosystems. And uh, just before we dive in, here's a quick look at our agenda for this webinar. Uh, Nicole will say a few words and introduce us to our panelists. Um, then Abby and Sandra will provide some background to the research. And after the presentations, Nicole will lead a discussion on the intersections between Sandra and Abby's work um, and explore their approaches to addressing um, our broken water cycle. And at the end of the webinar, we will be taking questions from the audience. Um, so we encourage you to participate. Um, feel free to enter questions um, in the go to um, kind of panel uh, in the chat section. Um, so feel free to participate that way. Uh, we will also be offering 20% uh, off discount codes um, for Abby and Sandra's books. So stay tuned at the end of the webinar for that slide. Uh, and after um, the webinar, we'll also follow up uh, with a recording as well as a brief survey um, about the webinar content. But for now, I will let Nicole take it away. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. I am so happy to be here with both Abby and Sandra. Um, and I, I, I hope those of you who are joining us on the phone um, have access to both their books. If you don't, that's fine. Um, we'll give you easy access to them at the end with those discount codes. Um, but these books are, they're wonderful journeys. Um, both books take us um, deep um, as well as wide in some ways um, into both the world of our rivers and um, making sure they stay wet and thinking about very creative um, opportunities as well as real world solutions to um, to making sure that that water is coming back into them and that the cycle of life can continue within them. Sorry for my background noise. I'm at an airport. <laughs> traveling um, to another part of the country, but I'm going to continue on. And then Abby's book is equally wonderful and does um, this wonderful deep dive into mussels, right? One of the various sets of families and species that rely so heavily on healthy, um, healthy rivers and clean water, you know, rivers that are um, ideally um, functioning in ways that allow them to be able to support the diversity of life that has evolved along their sides. Um, I know Sandra and Abby will do a wonderful job introducing themselves and their work, um, but for those of you who can see the slide, um, Sandra Pastel is director of the Global Water Policy Project and co-creator of Change the Course, the National Water Stewardship Initiative. Um, awarded the 2017 U.S. Water Prize for restoring billions of gallons of water to depleted rivers and wetlands. Um, Sandra's work has appeared in many places, including science, natural history, best American science and nature writing. If you haven't had the opportunity to meet Sandra in person, to hear her speak, to read her books, you're in for a real treat. Um, 
And then Abby, who um, I'm just getting to know myself, is a wonderful new addition to our um, wonderful water community. She is a writer, a veterinarian, and a naturalist. She won Duke University's Center for Documentary Studies 2015 Essay Award, an Arthur DeLong Writing Award, and was a finalist for the Constance Rook Creative Nonfiction Award. Um, as I said, I think these two authors really give us a wonderful treat. They bring us right alongside them in their adventures to better understand um, both water and why um, it's so complex and some of the real hope that's out there, as well as what we can learn from through the bird's eye view standing um, inside of a mussel. Um, so with that, um, Abby and Sandra, I'll have you introduce yourselves. Uh, Sandra first and, and then Abby. Uh, terrific, thank you, Nicole. This is Sandra Postel. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, having a little trouble moving the slide. Um, Sarah, if you, there we go, thank you. Let's see if I'm able to do this. Um, anyway, so thank you very much for joining. Um, as many of you know, I'm sure I've been working on water for a very long time. And I wrote Replenish from a place of what I would call realistic optimism. You know, we all know it's very easy to kind of sink into a state of despair these days when we think about, you know, the state of our water, the many ways, as we'll see in a minute, in which the water cycle is broken. But what I came to appreciate as I researched and, and, and wrote Replenish is that yes, the water cycle's broken, but there are so many ways we can fix it. And in fact, when we look out into the world with intention to find ways that it is being fixed, what I learned was that there's innovation, ingenuity, collaboration, some risk taking going on that shows that we can in fact fix this broken water cycle. And so I came to a place of realistic optimism that yes, things are bad, but, but we, can, we can really do something about it. Um, Sarah, I'm gonna have to, there we go. For some reason it's not, uh, the slides need your help in moving uh, forward. So you all know, I'm sure many of you know, the many ways in which this water cycle of, of ours is broken. And, and I come from, from a place of, um, a deep appreciation, I guess, for you know the water cycle really being the greatest gift our planet gives us. We wouldn't be here without it. And so, you know, these look like bullet points of you know of of interest, but in fact, these are very serious issues that really have to do with the health and quality of our whole civilization. And so, it's a very serious matter. And I'm not going to go into any great length, of course, on these. But wherever you live. Where, certainly where I live, where we all live, we can see elements of, of this broken water cycle. From the de degradation of watersheds, river depletion, we've lost 50% of our wetlands, extensive groundwater depletion, as much as 10% or more now of our food production around the world depends on the unsustainable use of groundwater. That's taking some of tomorrow's water and using it to meet our needs of today. So what do we do about that? Shrunken soil reservoirs. We have learned that soils can store, and this astonished me to learn this, that soils can store about eight times as much water as all rivers combined. But much of industrial agriculture, the deep plowing and the water and wind erosion that comes with that, the lack of cover cropping has caused that soil reservoir to shrink. What can we do about that? Toxic algal blooms have been much in the news um, over the last couple of years with uh, cities like Toledo having to shut down their water supply because of the toxic algal bloom that settled over the intake system. I write about Long Island and the challenge of, of dead zones and water uh, pollution that's, that's basically uh, affecting much of the coastline around Long Island, which happens to be where I grew up. And we have at this point more than 400 dead zones around the world. So this is a global problem and it's very much affecting the health and quality of not only our continental waters, rivers and groundwater, but our coastal zones as, as well. Is 
Thank Wonderful. You. And on top of all this, we have, you know, this problem now of, of climate change. And again, you can see the many ways, and these are just a subset of them, that climate change will affect uh, the water cycle. Most of the ways we experience climate change will be through that water cycle. And the main message here is that the past is no longer a good guide to the future. Hydrologists have said stationarity is dead which means that the natural variability we've grown accustomed to is no longer where we are, that we're outside of those boundaries. And so to me, if we can go to the next slide, to me, this means that this new normal requires some new thinking, right, about how we build a resilient and secure water future, how we conceive of it, how we pay for it, and how we create new partnerships to build it. Albert Einstein said, we cannot solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And I think that's a great backdrop for how we think about this new time. We can't do more of the same and expect a better result. And so that's really the foundational thinking for me as I approached writing the book and researching the book and looking at what's going on out there that is new, that is new thinking, that is going to build that kind of resilient and secure uh, water future. If we can go to the next one, that would be great. And so just to give you a smattering of what Replenish talks about, um, it's, a, it's really a, a, a collection of projects, of stories, of how people and partnerships are getting this work done. And it was so inspiring to me to meet so many people who are committed to this, who are really looking at innovative ways of, of fixing this broken water cycle. And I'm just going to say a sentence about each of these photos, if you have the photos in front of you. Interesting ways of replenishing groundwater in the Central Valley of California using wintertime flood water to replenish the groundwater supply below. Cities looking at green infrastructure, bioswales, and rooftop gardens and other ways of capturing stormwater and turning it from a from a nuisance into an asset looking at how we can replenish soils you can see these cattle here the techniques of managed grazing or rotational grazing mimicking how bison basically moved on the range back in the day showing us how you can naturally fertilize aerate the soil get more carbon into the soil expand that soil reservoir. Just one extra percentage point of carbon stored in the soil means as much as 18,000 more gallons of water stored in that soil per acre. Amazing. At the bottom right, Frank Gaminden, the ditch boss in the Verde Valley, showing off a brand new automated head gate that is allowing the irrigators in that valley to take just the water they need and leave the rest for the river. So a river that had been in some years completely dry for five, six, seven, eight miles, now has twice the summertime flow it had before. In the middle at the bottom, Casey Cox with the Flint River Partnership working in a river system that is chock full of important and diverse muscles to connect with Abby's book. And this is a project that our Change the Course initiative has been part of that basically is looking at how we can get smarter about how we irrigate in order to reduce groundwater pumping and keep more base flow in the tributaries of the Flint River Basin to benefit the mussels and the diversity of life in that river basin. And then finally, the kids of San Luis Rio, Colorado, swimming in a river that they had never seen, even though that river had given their town its name, the Colorado River. And this was during the amazing pulse flow of 2014, where it showed that a collaboration between two governments, the United States and Mexico, a diverse range of scientists across borders, farmers, cities coming together and saying, yes, we're in a drought situation. Yes, the Colorado is over allocated, but we can actually, if we want to, give some water back to the Colorado Delta. And these kids are playing in a river that they had never seen, even though it gave their town its name. So these are just a handful of the stories in Replenish. Um, and it basically showed me in the next slide that we can, if we choose, uh, write a new water story. And again, I'm sorry, I'm not able to move the slide forward, so I'm gonna rely on 
one of you to do that. There we go. Um, and so that's really the take home message. And um, I hope we can talk a bit more about this during our conversation. Um, Abby's book is amazing. If, you're, um, if you've never learned a thing about muscles, it's a fantastic place to start. And I'm thrilled to be joining today with, with Abby Landis in, in, in talking about the importance of muscles. So thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Abby, you wanna take, take us into the world of muscles? I do. I, there we go, Move, advance the slide. So um, in addition to being a, a big fan of Sandra and, um, and her work in, and across the globe on water issues, um, I'm a veterinarian and a mom who basically went for a day in a creek and never fully emerged. Uh, my immersion into the world of rivers and mussels um, involved both complete submersion into water and an absorbing involvement in learning about mussels and their bodies and their lives and habitats and their pivotal significance to water health. So the next slide shows the first creek that I snorkeled. And I'll rely on Sarah, I believe, to advance the slide. And the first creek where I snorkeled was Chihuahua Creek in March 2009. This is the town of Auburn, Alabama's water supply. And as I would later learn, the site of legal conflict over the creek's water, which centered on mussels and the endangered mussels that lived in this creek, as well as the town's water supply. For me, it was the beginning of my fascination with freshwater mussels and the incredible world that I found when I submerged my face under that water. And on the next slide, you'll see a pregnant female mussel. Uh, this one here at the top. Um, she is uh, displaying her lure, um, and these are her bulging gills full of her offspring. Um, and she displays this lure to attract a fish to host her larval offspring. As I began watching mussels and seeing females like this, I felt um, an obvious kinship with these mussels. As I was immersed in pregnancy and early motherhood myself, feeling the pool of releasing the next generation into a vulnerable world and what that meant because both the mussels and I um, and our offspring all would rely on the same water. So I became fascinated with mussels. And as you can see on the next slide, um, my infatuation was for obvious reasons. They're fantastic. They are beautiful in the way that we find seashells beautiful for various shapes and patterns. They're lined with a pearly lining that can be pink or white or purple. Their names poetically reflect their shapes uh, with characters such as the heel splitter, monkey face, shiny pig toe, fat mucket, and one of my favorites, the three horn warty back. They've been historically useful and treasured as tools and jewelry for native people, producers of wild freshwater pearls, and as material to make pearl buttons, which were widely popular for about 75 years until the invention of plastic and zippers. Their reproduction is, um, as we had a sneak preview, very fancy. Mussels copulate distantly when the male squirts semen into the water and the female inhales it to meet her eggs. And then she broods her larval offspring in these bulging marsupial gills. Those offspring have to have a fish host and the mussel has mussels have developed many fascinating tactics to launch their larvae onto the fish. So they lure fish in as one tactic. This is a mantle lure, it's part of her body, decorated to look like a minnow, complete, complete with an eye spot and striping. And when the fish strikes the minnow, she releases her tiny Pac-Man shaped larvae to clamp onto the fish gills where they can travel and transform um, to and their next life stage and drop off for their life on the river bottom. There are just over 
300 native freshwater mussel species in North America. And around 72% of them are imperiled. And this peril is alarming as it is closely linked with declines in water health. Um, as we think about what water will sustain us going forward, it's um, the mussels indicate uh, the difficulties we're having maintaining that water. On the next slide, we can see that um, in many ways, mussels are the river. They're, because of their lifestyle, they connect and reflect the health of the river as a whole. They live buried in the substrate, nestling into the rocks or mud or sand at the river bottom, and they rely on it being stable and undisturbed. The integrity of the river's channel influences the patterns and speed of water flow and the sediment in the water, and all of this um, directly and indirectly impacts mussels. Mussels, of course, rely on a reliable quantity of water. They cannot live for very long outside of water. Um, so they suffer with both droughts and floods um, because too much rapid flow can dislodge them. Mussels are filter feeders and they change and are changed by the water quality. They pass the river through their bodies. A mussel the size of a chicken egg can filter a half to one liter of water per hour. So they are filtering a significant quantity of the river. Water contaminants like chemicals and pharmaceuticals, excess nutrients and heavy metals all have impacts on mussels. And because mussels depend on fish, often specific fish species to complete their reproduction, their lives are tied to many other lives in a river and the diversity of those lives. On the next slide, you see a mussel nestled into the substrate, into the rocks on the bottom of Alabama's Paint Rock River. And her apertures are wide open and incidentally very beautiful. I think they look almost floral. Um, and one of them is the intake aperture and the other one's the outflow. So she is um, drawing in the river and passing it through her body. Her body is kind of like a stitch between the benthos or the river bottom and the water column. Um, she really connects water and geology that way. The Paint Rock River itself is one of those uh, realistically optimistic success stories. Um, on the next slide, you can see a mussel assemblage from the Paint Rock River. Despite its fish and mussel diversity being nearly wiped out in the 1980s, the river um, has rebounded under a Nature Conservancy-led collaboration to improve the watershed um, through many projects with landowners, and um, it now boasts over 100 fish species and 45 mussel species. Um, the river's just booming right along and is the picture of health um, and features an obviously gorgeous um, and inspiring diversity of mussels. And with the last slide, um, muscle, mussels' vulnerabilities can be our strengths. And so if we look to them to help guide our understanding and our actions on behalf of rivers, um, rivers where mussels flourish are healthy enough to sustain us too. And through mussels, we get the chance to indulge in a delight and a reverence for rivers as we consider how to help them heal. And so those are more pieces for discussion and I think um, relating very closely to what Sandra talked about. Fabulous, Abby. And that was such an articulate description. And you talk about um, your first instance sort of going inside, underneath the water, and discovering the world, right? The, this world that mussels live in. And it sounds almost as if that was the beginning of this infatuation, this sort of love story that you had for the species. I'm, I'm curious if did you grow up next to a river? Did you did you always have this deeper connection to water? I wish I could say I always did. I think I actually grew up on a farm, um, but my connection with water came much later. I think the my first experience snorkeling really was pivotal for me. Um, I had 
met mussels in the laboratory tanks, but had never observed them doing their thing in the wild. So on a day that I had off from being a, an emergency veterinarian, I zipped a wetsuit over my pregnant belly and joined my husband and the Auburn University muscle crew in Chihuahua Creek looking for mussels. And it far exceeded my expectations. What I thought was just a negligible creek kind of running under the bridge um, startled me with the clarity and life at the bottom. And what I thought were kind of drab, inert looking shells in the laboratory were delightfully lively animals in the creek. It, I was floored. And in the book, I, I say the creek bottom gained a dimension. And I, I think it wouldn't be exaggerating to say that my understanding of life gained a dimension. And I wanted to know more about these animals and more about the water that I knelt in that was the city water supply. Um, and so my infatuation with the mussels grew steadily. And as I asked more questions and had many um, what I call are you kidding moments when I learned something that completely surprised me, the mussels became really central to my education about about rivers and water. <clears throat> I, I love that. Uh, all right, Sandra, so similar question for you. When did you realize that you had this deep fascination with with rivers and how they function? Did you grow up next to a river? Did, did it come later in life? What, what was that transformative um, experience or set of experiences that, that have made you such a champion? Well, the, the, you know, the focus on rivers in a way was a journey for me because I grew up on Long Island where near the ocean. And so by all rights, I should have been a, an, a marine person, an ocean conservationist. But I, you know, I grew up with a very, I guess, kind of a sense of calling on, you know, to do something on behalf of the earth. And so my journey was really figuring out what is my niche. Uh, and it took me a while to find that, but not too long. Um, you know, that the calling was there, but where am I going to land? Where am I going to actually make, you know, my contribution? I remember my, I was so happy my parents took me as a young kid when I was 12 to Walden Pond in, in Massachusetts, which for me was a bit of a pilgrimage to see where Henry David Thoreau had written all those wonderful words. Um, but I would say it was, you know, really starting grad school. I majored in geology, starting, you know, work at grad school at Duke on, you know, wetlands and, and ecology and starting to really understand the freshwater environment. And then it was just luck, you know, that my first job out of grad school was was working on, on water issues. And I just fell in love with it. It sort of felt like I got bit by a bug and never let go. Um, and it felt like at that time, which we're talking way back now, um, there was there was an opportunity to fill an important niche there as we just were beginning to understand globally what was happening in terms of um, in terms of our of our rivers and lakes and groundwater it was a fairly new day um, opening up and so I was just very lucky to have those opportunities early on thank you that's 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 really helpful you know it's always interesting to ask ourselves you know where does that where does that passion first ignite um, and you know for those of us reflecting on how do we how do we do that for others, right? How do we um, create that spark that creates a sense of curiosity that you both have? Oh, Abby, I'd love you to take a moment and reflect upon some of the people who you encountered and whose stories, in a sense, you incorporate into your book who are, in a sense, wild for, for muscles. What What is it that keeps them going? Can you sort of paint a picture for us of, of some of those people who you encountered? So the people who love mussels and, and many of whom have dedicated their lives to understanding them and, and working for their health and the health of rivers um, have been a delight for me and a privilege to get to know. Um, they almost always in general remember their first encounter with mussels. Um, in a creek or river, whether it was finding shells as a kid um, or watching a muscle display as a college student, um, they can recite Latin names as if they are talking about old friends. Um, and they 
often in conversation speak intimately of creeks and rivers as if they carry a map in their head of the specifics of the riffles and the bends and the, the river bottom. Um, and so I feel like muscle lovers seem to carry a different kind of vision and memory for, for rivers. Um, and like many groups of people studying obscure animals, muscle scientists are often quirky um, in, in wonderful ways. They seem to be fueled by a bottomless love for these animals and the rivers. Um, and they're you know, putting on neoprene suits and diving into rivers um, that are murky and fast flowing and they're full of field stories, um, some of which have become legend, like the time in the 1980s when the biologist Steve Allsed's crew was um, in Virginia's Clinch River in January and a beer truck overturned on the bridge upstream from them. So they found themselves surrounded by a flotilla of beer bottles and um, <laughs> needed to call it a day. Um, I think any field scientist uh, or outdoors person ends up with many fascinating stories. And in my experience, the people who are studying mussels are incredibly generous with their time and knowledge rather than protective of it. Um, they are, um, have done a lot of groundbreaking work scientifically in getting to know these animals and their roles in the ecosystems. Um, and on the whole are um, filled with a, a desire to share that and combine efforts and collaborate um, to help muscles and find a way forward for muscles. Wonderful. All right, Sandra, similar question for you. So your travels and your book um, has a bit of a broader lens that carries you from New Mexico where you live to places um, all over the West and, and really around the world. And in conversation with, you know, people as diverse as farmers and water managers and conservation professionals and probably many others, can you, can you paint a picture for the audience about your impression uh, of the people who you're talking to and um, what do you think uh, allows them to have as much hope and excitement about their work? Well, I think the, and, and I did have the, the pleasure and benefit of meeting, you know, many wonderful people in the course of traveling and researching for Replenish. And I think what, when I think back on it, I think what they hold in common is, you know, a willingness to not only sort of think outside the box, but to realize there is no box, you know, that we are all in this together. There is one water and it's there to be shared. And so rather than sort of digging in heels and, 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 and trying to hold on to a status quo situation, there's just an ability to, to listen and explore and collaborate and find some new ways of solving problems. And I think that's the sort of common theme of the solutions that I, that I found most inspiring and that I found most interesting to write about. Um, you know, and, and there's a whole range of examples and types, you know, close to home for me um, is the Rio Grande Water Fund, which was really launched as uh, as a response to what at the time had been the biggest mega fire in New Mexico's history. When I showed my slides, you saw a picture of it. Um, the first day of that fire, the Las Conchas fire, which started in, in 2011 in June, in the first hour, that fire consumed about an acre every uh, second. For the first 14 hours, it burned an acre every second. It was the hottest, fastest fire New Mexico had seen. Well, we could sit back after that fire, you know, clean it up. You know, everyone knows what happens by now, right? You have tremendous amount of burned landscape. You know, this was a fire that burned 156,000 acres of the Jemez Mountains with no roots to hold the soil in place. The monsoon rains just brought all of that soil and debris and um, burned out tree trunks down toward the Rio Grande, which is the water supply for Albuquerque. The, the uh, intake had to be shut down, so it really affects on the, the security and quality of the water downstream. Well, when that was all done, and it took weeks for this to play out, one could have sat back and said, oh gosh, I hope that doesn't happen again anytime soon. 
But what was amazing was, again, spearheaded by the Nature Conservancy, a collaborative effort to secure, to make more secure that watershed, realizing that those mega fires are going to happen more often because droughts are going to happen more often. And to begin to connect the downstream users of water with the upstream landscape and its quality. So there's now the Rio Grande Water Fund is the most collaborative water fund I think that's been created. There are more than 60 signatory businesses, conservationists, local and state uh, government entities, as well as um, you know, federal entities, the Forest Service. And so it's a, it's a very, very collaborative uh, picture, including a million dollars kicked in by the Albuquerque Water Utility because they realize the quality of the watershed, even if they don't own it, is going to affect the quality of the water they, they get downstream. So this huge collaboration with a goal of restoring 600,000 acres of this watershed over the next 20 years and and the resilience that comes with people buying in to that vision um, and so I, I think it's a very inspiring story and and a good example i think of the many that are in replenish that show this this willing to talk to listen to come together and and find solutions that's that's incredibly helpful the um i'm i'm, I'm curious about as you, so those, that was a, for both of you, really a wonderful articulation of some of the sort of strength that you see and the hope um, and the opportunity at, in place, right, in different parts of the world, different parts of the country. Um, I'm curious if perhaps maybe Sandra and then Abby, if you would reflect a bit and, and, and share some of your perspectives about perhaps with the audience about, um, um, okay, well, say some of the audience members are not um, part of these bigger projects, and how would you, what would your recommendation be to them? How should they take the inspiration from your book um, and bring it either to their work or to their engagement? What, what, what opportunities do you see or do you hope to bring by by sort of shining a mirror on some of these incredibly brilliant stories that you both bring forward? Well, I think, um, it's a great question, Nicole. I think um, one of the, the key takeaways for me was that many of these projects, stories, you know, began with one or two people, you know, that, that it, it, we're not looking, these, these, are, these stories suggest that we don't have to wait for the policymakers in Washington, you know, to get the policies right, as important as that is, we don't need to wait for that to happen to start to see very positive change on the ground. Um, you know, I'm I'm an old policy wonk myself. I used to think, you know, if we just get the policy right, everything else will follow. And now what I've come to understand is we really need more bottom-up examples of what can be done. And then when policymakers look at you know, some of those things, the good things that are happening on the ground, um, I'll start to ask, why don't we have more of that? You know, when I look at the stories I tell, for example, in some of the Western rivers, the Verde River is a good example. You've got this triple win as a benefit. You know, you, you've kept water in the Verde. The irrigators haven't lost any water they need. The river is healthier, so there's more recreation, there's more economic benefit to the community from people coming to enjoy the river, to bird, to boat, to fish, to play, to enjoy the, 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 the more beautiful um, valley. So businesses benefit and of course habitat benefits, the birds, the fish, the wildlife. And so it will win. And then you start to ask, well, why aren't we doing that in more places? And hopefully the policy change will follow. You know, if you read this book, a big, question I think you get at the end is this is sort of a no-brainer why aren't we doing more of this and that's the hope I get from this is that if if people read it and look at it and policymakers start to look at it the question will be let's start scaling this up so again the takeaway is there's no place too small to start because we need all kinds of examples of innovation of collaboration to make these 
changes happen and to begin to understand what needs to happen to scale it up. You know, I was astonished to learn really for the first time, I, I have to make a confession that as a water conservationist, as a water researcher for all these years, I had paid way too little attention to the soil. You know, I'd focused on groundwater, I'd focused on rivers, I'd focused on watersheds, but not enough attention to the soil itself and the health of the soil and the importance of that soil reservoir. And when I learned that the simple act of cover cropping, putting crops on the soil when you're not growing your commodity crop, when you're when you're basically allowing the land to rest, covering that that soil with a cover crop can expand that soil reservoir, keep nitrogen and phosphorus from flowing off the land to create those dead zones, can store more carbon in the soil, can expand the soil reservoir. There's almost nothing you can name that can do as many things to benefit the soil and to benefit water and to benefit even climate as improving the health of our soils. And yet only 3% of our US cropland gets cover cropped. Well, there's a huge opportunity there. And so those are the kinds of things I hope will start to happen as we learn from these, these stories. Hmm. That's, that's very helpful. Well, Abby, I wonder if you want to sort of take that and, and, and give your own reflection about engagement. We've heard Sandra share some of the insights that she had about, well, you know, it, it only takes one or two or three people to get started. Sometimes just an individual um, who cares enough to to do something right and we need those examples I'm, I'm I'm curious about when you think about your book and the hope that you have for your book to make a difference um, I'm I'm sort of asking whether you have some insights or some um, um, encouragement for those folks who are who are listening in today to engage. Thanks. I think um, I think that I hope with this book um, that it is an invitation. Um, and I think that that's what I have found through getting to know muscles is that there is an invitation to an astonishment and a curiosity and concern um, and different layers of reverence and respect um, for the water. It's very personal. Um, it only takes one or two people or even just an individual to start to change things. And it's, and it's because it's very uh, at a personal level. Um, I think about, you know, a handful of individuals at the Alabama Aquatic Biodiversity Center um, headed by Paul Johnson, um, who's quite a character. And um, I visited him and he drove me out to a pond and we knelt on a dock and there was a white plastic bucket um, that he pulled out of the water and inside was a pile of young greenish yellow mussels. Um, and they were Alabama lamp mussels, which are endangered since 1976. And he said, this is more than exist in the world right here in this bucket. Um, and I held one in my palm and thought about the, the work that he and, and really, you know, a handful of individuals do to make a difference in the survival of an entire species. Um, and then I also thought about, you know, the water in that pond or the water coming into my house um, and how it relates to those muscles. Um, and I think it can start with, with simple curiosity and questions um, right at home. You know, where does, where does the water that comes out of your tap come from? Um, what impacts the quantity and quality of that water? What, where do you see that water flowing across the surface in rivers and streams? Um, and then is that the same water that everyone in your community has access to and the same water that um, you know, impacts the food that you eat? It's, it is very um, personal. And I think a lot of the examples that Sandra details so beautifully are really, you know, these incredible stories of communities looking at a specific problem that they have 
and just really starting to come together and collaborate across their differences to to, to brainstorm solutions that that maybe we haven't even thought of yet. Um, so I, I find a lot of hope in acting out of a sense of cherishing something and valuing something um, as much as a sense of, of concern for it. Um, just beautiful sentiment. Um, I, I love this quote from your book on page 135. If a river is a body, the river channel is both its skeleton and its skin. The channel holds and shapes a river's innards, the flowing blood and the visceral organs. It's, it's so poetic and really gives us a very different impression of how rivers function. So, you know, I just want to say thank you again for bringing this book to the world, to our attention and giving us a, a, a journey into the world of, of, of muscles that's, that's so, you know, deeply encouraging and hopeful and fascinating. Um, you know, I've, I've been fascinated by muscles for probably 20 years. And, and like I said at the beginning, I, I still learned something new um, in your book. And, and it's just an absolutely wonderful um, exploration. And, and Sandra, I, I want to key off of something that um, Abby said to you. Your, your book does um, do so much to sort of talk about community and, and in your book, um, I think towards the end, maybe page 200, 230 something, 235, I think, you, you talk about, or the quote is, our challenge as a society is to build resilience, the ability to cope with disturbance while continuing to function. And I just love that, you know, that yes, there is going to be disturbance, but there is also this sort of recognition that if we work together and if we understand these, um, these systems better, perhaps there's an opportunity for us collectively um, to do more to support their health and um, their importance to society and to our lives. Um, Sarah, with that, I think we should um, take a couple questions from the audience, and I think you um, can see those questions. So perhaps for the audience members, um, Sarah, why don't you guide them to either use chat or the question box on their screens. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. We've had a couple come through, um, but I encourage uh, other attendees to, to chime in um, with their questions. I also, um, we've had this slide up, but just want to direct um, the audience's attention to um, the two discount codes we have available um, for Landis, for Immersion, and for Postel, for Replenish. Um, hopefully, uh, this conversation will inspire you to do a deeper dive um, into the material and um, purchase those books uh, via islandpress.org. And so one question we have um, directed uh, more at Abby, um, for citizens who are concerned um, about the health of their local rivers and the mussels that may reside in that river, um, how would one go about obtaining the status um, of that health? Is, is this public record? Um, how do people engage in that? Good question. So there are definitely resources. Um, I would start with um, state, um, whether it's in your state of Department of Environmental Conservation, um, your state Department of Natural Resources. Um, and typically in those departments, they have a non-game biologist uh, of some type, um, we hope, who is who is looking out for animals like freshwater mussels. Um, there are often aquatic biologists that you can contact. Um, and so that's a great place to start, a great resource. Um, you can go through um, colleges or universities. You might have um, folks who, who are studying or knowledgeable about your area and the aquatic life in your rivers. Um, and tapping into groups such as the Nature Conservancy um, or local riverkeeper groups. Um, many 
areas have a friends of group who is, um, you know, just maybe a group of people you might even know in your community who are looking out for the local um, river or creek and, um, and keeping close tabs on the health of that. And, and just to just to jump in there, within the next um, couple of months, River Network will have a map up on our website of all local efforts all over the country. So available to everyone at the click of a mouse, you'll be able to find what local groups, um, well, what groups are working at the local level around the country. That may include the Nature Conservancy and some of the keepers, but also many of the friends groups, as Abby was mentioning. There are many, 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 at least 3,000 groups working at the local level, and they are your friends and, and are right there um, ready to help. Excellent. We have another question um, coming through from an individual who works um, with legislators uh, from the 13 Western states, um, directed at Sandra. If you could offer one or two policy recommendations to this group of legislators, um, what would you suggest? Uh, well, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, you know, I think particularly it, 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 the question is focused more on the West. I think looking at how, um, and, and again, Western water policies and laws vary state by state. So you have a layer of federal policies and incentives, and then more importantly, perhaps at the state level are, are what the state policies and laws themselves say and do. Um, and I think there are many opportunities there to, to give more incentives for that smarter water use, for increasing irrigation efficiency, for allowing water to be shared um, in different ways. You know, so we've begun to see, for example, the importance of water transactions, the ability for water to move from an agricultural use, for example, into a you know, environmental purpose to keep a river wet, as Nicole talked about earlier. Um, it's, 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 it requires some, some interesting thinking and changes in law sometimes because in the West, as many of us know, you know, we have a prior appropriations doctrine, a use it or lose it philosophy where irrigators find it difficult to share water because they risk losing their water right. So it's very important to have an ability to transfer water that doesn't risk the loss of that water right. Um, the Change the Course initiative that that I helped to start with, with partners um, has been working as a partner on some of these types of projects where, um, for example, um, let's say you have an alfalfa uh, grower um, who finds that it makes more sense to receive, you know, income um, rather than growing and, and irrigating that last uh, cutting of hay, which often in the summertime requires a lot of water and doesn't produce as much yield, to basically save that water for a river or a creek that needs water during that late summer and accept a payment in return for using that water for that environmental purpose. That's a great win-win situation that sort of needs to be enabled through policy. Um, you know, we have in the, West, in the West now, you know, the Colorado River system um, pilot program where it's encouraging these kinds of water transactions. And I think more support for that would be great. Um, you know, there's the EQIP program through the USDA, which helps farmers do on-farm irrigation efficiency improvements, like, for example, shifting to drip irrigation. If we could expand that program to include system efficiencies, like putting in those head gates on the irrigation ditch system in the Verde Valley, that would create more incentive and more financial support for doing efficiency upgrades at the system scale, where you can upgrade canals and, and ditches and so on. And that would help a lot. So there are a number of things that can be done on the policy side, I think, to you know to get water more moving more flexibly and to encourage that more efficient, more smart use of water. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Sandra. That's actually um, very prescient because we just had a question come in um, kind of piggybacking on that about how policies will impact um, agriculture and farming. So I'm, I'm glad that that was able to be incorporated uh, into that answer as well. Um, we have another question 
um, about um, scale of the examples um, in terms of how how scalable are these these local examples are can can they and and how can they um, be applicable to uh, larger watershed scales? I think that is the million dollar question with this is the scale <laughs> issue. And I think from the work that I've done, just about all of these examples that I talk about in Replenish are scalable. Um, and so the, the idea is to, okay, what are those policies? What are those incentives? What are those uh, changes that can, that can help us scale up? So if we just look at a couple, for example, um, you know, I talked about the importance of groundwater recharge and, and replenishing that groundwater reserve. You know, California um, is the, one of the examples I use of taking that wintertime flood water that has come during some of those wet years, especially last year when ca California got a deluge in the wintertime, and channeling that water to farm fields and using orchards and, and other other cropped areas during the dormant season to recharge the groundwater below so that we begin to deal directly with that depletion problem. Well, the California Groundwater Act passed in 2014 will motivate more of that kind of thing. You know, California was late to coming to, to managing its groundwater um, better and, and passing a law to do so, but better late than never. And right now, you know, the irrigation districts throughout California are beginning to grapple with, well, how do we achieve a better balance in our water use by, you know, by 2040? And there'll be five-year check-ins on that. So groundwater replenishment now has a direct incentive as a result of that law to happen on a wider scale. And I think we'll see that, I think we'll see that happen. So that's just, you know, that's just one example. Um, you know, interesting, I mentioned earlier about um, the use of techniques of managed grazing <clears throat> and rotational grazing to improve the health of grasslands. Well, very interesting partnership um, has come of that with uh, the Audubon Society, Nat the National Audubon Society, partnering with private ranchers who are, who are doing rotational grazing to improve grassland habitat, and again, improving the water storage and the soil, which improves that habitat, because grassland birds are at great risk. And Audubon sees an opportunity to give an incentive to private ranchers to do that kind of more intentional rotational grazing to improve habitat for the grassland birds. And so they've come up with a bird-friendly beef certification, where if you're a consumer and you wanna buy the most environmentally sound meat that you can buy, you can look for that certification and realize, oh, this, this particular bit of beef that I'm buying is certified by Audubon to have been beneficial for grasslands and the habitat and the birds. And so that's a really neat sort of, you know, connection from the land to the consumer that might incentivize more ranchers to do this more environmentally sound way of raising their cattle and producing beef. So there are all kinds of examples like this of how we can scale these things up in a way that's benef beneficial to all involved. And that's really an inspiring part of the story, I think. Excellent. Well, thank you. And in our uh, waning minutes, I just want to address um, a somewhat administrative question we've had from the audience. Um, I'm going to stop presenting my screen because we've had a request for the slides to be uploaded. Um, so what I'll do for um, the attendees that we have is to submit it um, via the handout section. Um, so you should see that coming forward in just a second. Um, but in the meantime, I want to thank um, our panelists, um, everyone for participating. Um, Nicole, if you have any last thoughts, um, you know, I'll let you close out the the session. Hmm. Well, my my final thoughts are just a big a big warm thank you to both Abby and and Sandra. I think pairing these books um, was a brilliant idea from Island Press. They both look at rivers in a very intimate way and, and a very different way. Um, there's a lot of fascinating overlap for us to gain um, by, by sort of absorbing the content of both books in, in terms of how we think about fixing our broken water cycle and really the sense of hope that's out there um, and the opportunity that's out there 
to make a difference. So thank you both for giving the audience um, um, that sort of courage to uh, continue to push forward for clean water and healthy rivers. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.